good to see you here and for those that are joining us online. You know, a couple of days ago, we decided that we were going to have worship services today regardless of the weather. And we weren't sure if anybody was going to be here. So we're glad that you're here. Had somebody call this morning and said, what time do your services start? And I said, what time can you be here? <laughs> this morning, our brass choir is playing and uh, their prelude is, is going to make you realize it was worth coming to church just to hear this one song. It's called uh, Fanfare and Flourishes. Listen carefully. Adjust your hearing age for that one, don't you? That was beautiful, nice and loud. I like it loud. By the way, John Dill, you can never play too loud. I just want you to know that. That's, that's my advice to you. Speaking of loud, last Sunday, you did so well. I said to Cynthia before we ever got here, you think they're going to really shout? She goes, of course they're going to shout. Boy, did you shout. It was heard all the way to California. We have friends in San Diego who watch the program, not, not program, who, who are part of our worship service every Sunday. And um, she wrote uh, in an email, she said, we really enjoyed seeing the, the, the man play the kudu horn, remember that? That that Brian Light played, and then and, and then we shouted. And she said, We're here at home, and we shouted. She said, you know, there was a 4.0 earthquake in San Diego <laughs> at 946 in the morning. So we have checked the building for cracks, and every, everything seems to be in good shape. So thank you for participating. I just am crazy about you folks, how you throw yourself into it. You, you uh, show such respect for the, for the Word of God. You listen intently and, and you, you care. That, that means so much. Thank you for all you mean to us as a family and for all you mean to those who, who need you. And there are many today who do. If you're a guest of ours online, we're so glad to have you wherever you may be. We are glad you're here to enjoy great music and uh, to be a part of our time together. It's invaluable. 
especially today, the music is superb. We're going to enjoy uh, the, the words that uh, our friend from Missional Living will be sharing. Keith Tyler leads our Missional Living ministry, and he tells you uh, words for you who visit with us. So listen to those instructions. And then he tells you about uh, what we do every year is a very special feature of our outreach beyond our own community even that we participate in together. So here's Keith Tyler. Listen closely. Hey, Stonebriar family. I'm Keith Tyler, your pastor of Missional Living. First up, just want to welcome any of you who are new or visiting with us today. We're so glad that you're with us. If you'd like to get connected, just scan the QR code that's on the back of the seat that's in front of you, or stop by one of our info desks after worship today. Now, here's something for everyone. We've got an exciting service opportunity coming up this month, so listen to how you can make an impact around the world right here from Frisco. After a year on break, the big pack is back. That's right. We're partnering with Feed My Starving Children once again to pack meals for kids in need, and you're invited to join in. If you don't already know, Feed My Starving Children is one of our partner organizations. They provide food for kids around the globe, and every meal is hand-packed by volunteers like you. Join us right here on the Stonebriar campus on February 25th and 26th to pack meals, serve on the crew, and help this big event run smoothly. This is a great way to serve as a family, and you can invite your friends to join the fun. There are a few new guidelines for this year's pack, so be sure to check out all the details when you sign up to serve. Remember, with special needs and you'd like to serve in a more sensory-friendly environment, we've got you covered. We'll have our special needs packing night on February 24th so everyone can help turn hunger into hope. Another way you can help is by giving. Each meal from Feed My Starving Children takes less than 25 cents to make, so every donation makes a difference. So let's come together to help kids in need and glorify God as we go. You can find details, sign up to serve, and give online today at stonebriar.org slash FMSC. The theme of our worship this morning is the cross. We'll be singing about the cross of Christ. The Bible tells us that many people think the message of the cross is, is silly. It, it, it's foolishness. They would wonder why we have hanging in our chancel area an ancient instrument of torture. But for those of us who believe the cross is very precious and we glory in the cross because of what it represents and it's our means of salvation. Let me tell you where we're going in the singing this morning. We're going to start with a majestic triumphant hymn, Lift High the Cross. And we're going to sing three more softer reflective hymns about the cross. Misty Miller will sing a solo that personalizes all of this message. And then as a response to that, I'll ask you to stand, and we're going to sing together, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. For now, let's stand, please, and sing, Lift High the Cross. Let 
screen are some words from 1 Peter and Isaiah. Let's all quote this together. You were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold, but with precious blood as a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. He took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him, and by His wounds we are healed.
it be? And can it be?
rejoice in glory in the cross this day. It was our pathway to salvation. We give you great praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Magnificent worship. Magnificent. I have a serious word for us from God's book today. It doesn't all end here, but it leads into next week where we turn the corner and, and hear of God's grace at work to lead the people into victory. But today is a story of defeat. We've all known defeat. So we'll not have difficulty identifying with what it means to fail. As the Hebrews failed, when they attempted to take the little city of Ai without once consulting the Lord. So I'll be reading for you the story of this failure in Joshua chapter 7. Bear with me. It isn't an easy message to deliver. Joshua 7, beginning in verse 1. Please stand with me. But Israel violated the instructions about the things set apart for the Lord. A man named Achan had stolen some of these dedicated things, so the Lord was very angry with the Israelites. Achan was the son of Carmi, a descendant of Zimri, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah. Joshua sent some of his men from Jericho to spy out the town of Ai, east of Bethel, near Beth Amon. When they returned, they told Joshua, there's no need for all of us to go up there. It won't take more than two or three thousand men to attack Ai, since there are so Few of them don't make all our people struggle to go up there. So, approximately 3,000 warriors were sent, but they were soundly defeated. The men of Ai chased the Israelites from the town gate as far as the quarries, and they killed about 36 who were retreating down the slope. 
The Israelites were paralyzed with fear at this turn of events and their courage melted away. Joshua and the elders of Israel tore their clothing in dismay, threw dust on their heads and bowed their face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord until evening. Then Joshua cried out, O oh, sovereign Lord, why did you bring us across this Jordan River if you're going to let the Amorites kill us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side Lord, what can I say now that Israel has fled from its enemies? Verse 10, the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why are you lying on your face like this? Israel has sinned and broken my covenant, they have stolen some of the things that I commanded must be set apart for me. And they've not only stolen them, they've lied about it and hidden the things among their own belongings. That is why the Israelites are running from their enemies in defeat. For now Israel itself has been set apart for destruction. I will not remain with you any longer unless you destroy the things among you that were set apart for destruction. You may be seated. Don has led us in prayer. That will suffice. Search your heart during this time of a musical interlude. The sin was in the camp and no one knew it until it was finally exposed and dealt with. Search your heart, open your mind, be willing to hear everything that's said.
Secret sin is never a pleasant subject to address. Such sin includes hidden disobedience, followed by deceptive hypocrisy. Because deceit causes others to believe what is not true, when the truth ultimately comes out and, and is discovered and fully exposed, others are shocked, sometimes devastated. It's bad enough that wrong took place, but when there is cover-up during a period of time when you knew nothing of any of it, deceit adds betrayal to the sin, causing those who trusted the individual to feel defrauded, taken advantage of. But there's another dimension that must be mentioned in this sordid equation. Invariably, there are others who get caught in the web of deception, though they are completely innocent of the sin. They had no part in it. They knew nothing of it, yet they suffer the consequences from it, which makes the deception all the more harmful and heartbreaking. Let me add, the longer the deception continues, uh, the greater the fallout. To borrow from an old expression, when there is sin in the camp, all the campers are contaminated by it. Let me add, before the deceiver is discovered, there are often subtle signs of uneasiness. that occur. You, you can't put your finger on what it is, but something just isn't right. Morale begins to wane. Excitement fades. And before long, You can't seem to get off first base. You're stuck. To make matters more complicated, you can't figure out why. Sometimes it leads to a huge, inexplicable, cataclysmic event, as in the case of the Hebrews, as in the case of a church that suddenly discovers its pastor has been living a lie over a period of months, and you never knew it. You never, never knew it. A double life has been going on. That explains, finally, why you can't get back on target. Why, why the ministry lacks what was once so magnetic, powerful. All of these things bring us to the seventh chapter 
of Hebrews, of, of, uh, of Joshua, as the Hebrews suffer a shocking defeat. What I overlooked last time we were together is telling you of a prohibition that the Lord gave the Hebrews prior to entering Jericho after the walls fell. Do not touch the spoil. Do, do not take anything for yourself. Hands off. Everything is to be burned. Anything of silver and gold and bronze and iron, however, is to be preserved and put in the treasury of the Lord in the tabernacle. But you take nothing. Nothing. I'm sure when Joshua got those instructions, he had a special meeting to announce that to everyone in the camp. The walls will fall. The people will surrender. The place will be ours. Walk through it. See whatever has been left, leave it alone. The ominous word that begins this seventh chapter is worth noting. But only three letters, but it's announcing something different. Chapter 6 is all about victory, remarkable, miraculous falling of the walls, surrender of the people, destruction of all of that area, preservation of those sacred things, the burning of everything else, but Israel violated the instructions about the things set apart for the Lord. It doesn't simply say one man, it says Israel. In, in this case, where one sins, they all suffer. In many cases, the same is true. No church stands idly by as the pastor is exposed for his double life, defrocked, removed from ministry, humiliated, along with his family. The church suffers. It bears the brunt of it. Sometime they cannot recover. A man named Achan had stolen some of these dedicated things, so the Lord was very angry with the Israelites. Achan was the son of Carmi, a descendant of Zimri, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah. Interesting, the whole chapter begins with that. But you know, Joshua's writing this journal of his after the fact. He, he knew nothing of this before the fact. They'd taken Jericho, and next in line was a little two-bit city of Ai on the hill, so small that after the spies got back, they said, Joshua, Joshua, we don't need the whole camp to get armed and make its move up there. Just a few can take it. Look at 
Jericho in ruins, and and you 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 pick up a touch of overconfidence. They're bulletproof, invincible. We took Jericho. AI is a piece of cake. Not a word of prayer. No time set apart to seek the Lord. What do you say to us? How should we go about this? Joshua hears the spies. The spies give him their counsel. Humanly speaking, it made sense. Divinely speaking, they ran ahead. All the while, Achan, with his hidden goods beneath his tent, said nothing. His family must have known in a tent that size, whoever is under that tent would know what was being hidden in the tent, of course, which explains why the family was also ultimately disciplined. But back to AI. 3,000 warriors make their move up the hill, and before you know it, they are in a fast retreat down the slope. 36 of the Hebrews' finest are killed in the retreat. Now we have 36 families grieving the death of their dads, their husbands, the camp is in confusion. How could this be? We just took Jericho. Now we're run out of town by AI. There's sin in the camp. Therefore, you're ill-equipped to go any further till you deal with it, deal with it. Interesting, when Joshua gets word about the retreat, he falls on his face along with the elders and, and throws dust on their heads and they, and they are there till evening. All of this is a sign of humiliation, brokenness, embarrassment, bankruptcy, in the eyes of the enemy. And then Joshua cried out, listen to the blame. There's a tone of blame in these words. Joshua cried out, oh, sovereign Lord, why did you bring us across the Jordan River if, if you were going to let the Amorites kill us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side. What can I say now that Israel has fled from its enemies? For when the Canaanites and all the elders and, and, and all the other people living in the land hear about it, they will, they will surround us and They will wipe out our name from the face of the earth. And then what will happen to the honor of your great name? The Lord is not moved over his words. You will observe in verse 10, the rather passionate demand, get up, get up. He repeats it in verse 13, get up. Eugene Peterson in the message renders it, get started, meaning you got homework to do, Joshua. 
rather than grousing about what I have done or not done. It's time for you to do what you should have done to begin with. You search your heart before any battle. You come before me before any invasion is attempted. You may have made your mark on Jericho. That says nothing about AI. All is not well, Joshua. There's sin in the camp. So the Lord um, spells out how to handle it. He tells Joshua to bring before him the tribe, the clans, the families, like an hourglass narrowing down until you finally come to the guilty one. Do it right, Joshua. Take your time. This sin has roots. Let's dig them out. You know what I think? I think it's the first time it dawned on Joshua that there was anyone walking in this kind of disobedience. I think Joshua believed his people were, 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 were faithful, heard the prohibition, of, they were willing to abide by it, and when he hears this one needs to be singled out, it must have taken him back. There's always a sense of shock when you find that someone has been living in deceit. Bad enough that they've sinned, but they're now living hypocritically. Takes a real toll on the morale. So Joshua doesn't waste time. He moves into the setting. After all, the blood of 36 warriors call for accountability. So, in they come. I want to spend some time in verses 19 to 21. Look closely. 19. Then Joshua said to Achan, this is after they have whittled it down and come to the man. He said to Achan, Achan stands before Joshua and this dialogue transpires. My son, give glory to the Lord, <clears throat> the, God of his, the, the God of Israel, by telling the truth. <clears throat> You've not done that until now. I suggest you do it now. Say it all. There's something, a cleansing about truth. Something beautiful about coming clean. Make your confession and tell us what you have done. Don't hide it from me. Achan replied, now I want you to watch closely. It is true I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Wait, before you're too impressed with an open confession. He didn't volunteer it. He didn't volunteer it. It was demanded of him. He was caught. It's true I've sinned. Now he goes into the process. This is how deceit develops. Read it for yourself. Among the plunder 
I, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins, and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much that I took them and I hid them in the ground beneath the tent, the silver buried deeper than the rest. Look at the verbs I saw. I wanted. I took. I hid. Everything begins at the eye gate. Nothing wrong with seeing the garment. There's no sin in a glance. As he walked along, there was this Babylonian garment. Must have been colorful. Stood out in the ruins of Jericho and The wrong came in the second glance, and the third, as he lingered and saw himself wearing the robe. I wanted it so badly. He is drawn to these items. James writes of it better than in any other. James 1, 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. Hear this. Everyone is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Listen to that word, enticed. It's a fishing term. It means to lure by a bait. You cast it out. And the fish is safe. Just glancing at this lure. But when he wants it, he's enticed. And you see the raw act of disobedience. I took it. And then, why else would he hide it? Knew it was wrong, so he hid it like every deceiver. He didn't talk about it with his friends. He certainly didn't bring it before God. All of this is done alone by Achan. Slips into his tent, digs up an area, shoves him down there. Quite likely with the family watching. In my study, I came across a page from F.B. Meyer's work on Joshua that made me stop. It's a little bit convoluted for you to hear it, so you'll need to concentrate. It's worth the time. Listen closely to Meyer's analysis of Aiken's sin and our sin as well. The princes of Israel passed before them first, and then the prince of Judah was taken. Then the families of Judah and that of the Zarhites was taken. Then the Zarhites and Zabdi was taken. Then Carmi, then Achan. How his heart must have stood still.
as he saw the inevitable closing in of his destiny like, like the contracting walls of a chamber of horrors on a hapless victim. But sin is sporadic, Meyer continues. To deal with it thoroughly, hear this well, we need to go back to its parentage, its beginnings. All who have carefully watched the processes of the inner life bear witness that a long period will often intervene between the first germ of sin in a permitted thought or glance of evil and its flower or fruit in its act. We generally deal with the wrong that flames out. We should go behind to the spark as it lay smoldering for hours before and to the carelessness which left it there. We only awake when the rock disintegrates and threatens to fall upon our cottage roof. He continues. God would lead us back to the moment when a tiny seed born on the breeze floating through the air, found a lodgment in some crevice of our heart. And although the soil was scanty, succeeded in keeping its foothold till it had struck down its tiny root and gathered strength enough to split the rock which had given welcome love that writing. The sin comes in its innocent form, if you will, and it's not yet found root. There's a crevice in the heart. It finds its way in, in the lodgment of the heart and ultimately puts its root down till it splits the rock. And by, the, by, the, by this insight into small beginnings, our God would, would forearm, forearm us against catastrophes. What we call sin is the outcome of sin permitted. Days, perhaps weeks before which in the meanwhile had been gathering strength within the heart. I, I, I don't know where you are right now. I don't know what you've been looking at. I don't know what crevice is open, nor you with me. So we must judge ourselves, which Achan never did. And when it came time to walk away from the garment, he lingered and imagined himself in it. A man may observe the beauty of another woman, not his wife. There's no sin in observing that she's beautiful, but when she becomes alluring, he sunk. He's being enticed. And at that moment, well, as one man puts it, at that moment, Satan does not here fill us with hatred for God, but forgetfulness of God. And our senses become dulled and the prohibition can't really be that significant, or I'm not sure that's what Joshua said or God meant. 
I don't even remember fully what was said. Hear the forgetfulness? The man wants her so much, takes her. She yields, and adultery is born. And the sin is hidden, eating like a cancer on the marriage. This is tough stuff, folks. This isn't ancient Hebrew history. This is today. Whatever the garment may be, or the coins of silver in your pocket or the bar of gold. Glance, but go on. But Achan didn't go on. He took it and he hid it. And 36 men died because of it. There are consequences that follow disobedience. We live in a day of consequences. Would that we had those who lead our nation, who had the spine to stand for the things of God and call wrong, wrong and declare truth that cuts through all the garbage of the fog of our culture. Verses like this are neither easy to read or given respect in our day where many in places of authority are oblivious to sin and soft on crime. So the great care is given that we protect the guilty as we ignore and push away the victim. It's a whole rewriting of God's dictionary. What he says is wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. It'll always be wrong. It's wrong now, it was wrong in the 16th century. It was wrong in the 18th century. It will be wrong in the 26th century. It's wrong. What's right is right, will be right, stays right. The standard does not change. Let me show you a verse of scripture I came across in my study, Isaiah 5, 20 and following. If you choose not to turn, I'll save you the time. Isaiah 5, 20. What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil. The dark is light and light is dark. That bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. What sorrow for those who are wise in their own eyes and think themselves as clever. What sorrow for those who are heroes at drinking wine and, and, and boast about all the alcohol they can hold they, they take bribes to let the wicked go free and they punish the innocent. Isaiah, 700 years before Christ. Men and women, I have ministered for years, and some of my ministry has been heartbreaking in dealing with situations where sin was covered up. 
especially because that's my realm, in the realm of ministries. I've watched ministry constituents disillusioned because the leader was a liar, lived a lie, conducted himself or herself in deceit. Everyone believed in her or him till it was exposed and then it was like the walls came tumbling down. Churches weep around this world as individuals who were once trusted to handle the sacred things and to minister in honesty and truthfulness only to be exposed as hypocrites, liars. I, I, I know you, you, you may think this doesn't apply to me. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a pastor. I'm not, a, I'm not even an elder. Stop, stop, stop right there. You're in the family. Does it affect your family when one of your members is very sick? Drastically. And perish the thought when one dies. The grief is hard to put into words. We're a family. We are family. We owe it to one another to to walk in the light as he is in the light. God isn't looking for perfection. He's looking for integrity, honesty. All of this brings me to four very short, strong applications. Short so you'll remember them, strong so they will make an impact. One. Take God seriously. He must be honored. He's not our great big friend upstairs. Stop thinking that if that happens to be your twisted idea of God. He is the sovereign Lord of our lives who determines the day of our conception and the day we breathe our last. He is the sovereign God who gifts us and directs our steps and longs for us to walk in holiness and to honor him with our every day. Knowing when we will not do so, he is ready to forgive us. That is not a good guy upstairs. That is the one who rules and reigns over us and has every right to do so. Treat him with respect. Take him seriously. Hold him in awe. Reserve awesome for him. Take God seriously. Second, believe his word. Thankfully, we have the book of God. The mind of God in print, in our language. Believe it. He must be honored. His truth must be obeyed. He, he doesn't write these things to entertain us or simply inform us. He's hoping to change our lives by this. Including my life, which certainly needs to be changed regularly brought into alignment with his truth. I live my life under the authority of this book. Just as accountable as every one of you. Take God seriously. Believe his word. Third, confess sin quickly.
Don't take your cues from the evening news. Don't pay attention to the culture. It's a fog. It's designed to make you feel good or to get you off course. You've done wrong, confess it. First to your inner circle of those nearest you and then to those in the next circle. Confess the sin. Hiding must be rejected in the family of God. Fourth and finally, refuse all hypocrisy. Refuse it. Be who you are. Don't lead anyone to believe something you're not. Correct them if they are beginning to think so. Keep yourself off a pedestal. They may love you and they may respect you. Remind them often how human you are. And you are not the model. Christ is. They're not accountable to you. We all are to Christ. Refuse all hypocrisy because deception must be stopped. It must be stopped. The family of God has endured enough of it. And may purity begin at Stonebriar Community Church. If we're known for nothing else, let's be known for our truthfulness. Let's tell the truth. Let's live the truth. Let's model the truth. Let's uphold the truth so that God would be glorified and there would be no shocking discovery after the fact that someone lived a lie. I'll never forget standing in front of a large Bible class, over 200 people, having been taught by this doctor of theology teacher, a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary. who forfeited the right to teach that class because he had been carrying on an affair with a student in the school where he taught as the chairman of the Bible department. I looked into their faces like I'm looking into yours. There was hardly a dry eye in the place. Several got up, walked out, and I never saw them again at that church, our church, thinking that's it. I believed in that man no longer. And the world around us has a field day when that kind of hypocrisy is made known. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong castle. And the offense lingers throughout their lives. Don't think your life doesn't matter. To some people, you are their model. You are the one they quote. You are the one they watch. They believe in you. I'll leave it with you to read verses 24 to 26. But Achan was removed from the camp and a pile of stones remained to that day as a reminder of the trouble he brought to the Hebrews. If you're here without Christ, let me tell you there's no way you can change your, your habits. That sin life that you have lived is a, is a way of life and you can no more break it, alter it, improve it, 
than the man in the moon. So the only hope is that you come to the one who can give you recovery, renewal. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are new. Trust in Christ. What hope there is in that. Dear Father, we uh, have walked through this seventh chapter of Joshua in a very dramatic way and will not soon forget what we have heard. May we never fully forget it. Remind us, Lord, when we see the garment, the silver and the bar of gold, to keep walking on, not to linger, not to rationalize, not to desire it, take it, and hide it. Clean us up, Lord. Where there is hypocrisy, may it stop. Where there is deceit, may it cease. That we might be, for those who still believe that there are a few churches that honor Christ, that we would be one of them by your grace. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Everyone said, everyone said, amen.